is going to be speaking with us very soon. So Shalom, welcome. And we can't wait to hear from you. Like we are waiting for the loads of things you have for us today. So welcome, welcome, welcome. So let's, um, I think we'll be waiting for a few other people to join before we kick off. But today is going to be very amazing. Just trust me, it's going to be very amazing. Just like the past two days, we don't expect anything less than what you have been experiencing from the past two days. So um, let's let's keep our fingers crossed while we um, start the event proper. we go into the proper event for today. Let me just give you the past two days. Like it's the past two days have been so amazing. I've been learning a lot. Like even just just seeing the people that I've been looking up to speaking to me and trying to like motivate me and telling me about their backgrounds and how tough it was for them. It really gave me some like um motivation to keep going. So the first day we had um different guests from um acts to geek to Thor to um Bumi. they are very very amazing set of people that i have always wanted to speak with so the um session was very very nice the first day they really debugged for us like the experience was very very nice very very nice so it was a very marvelous um session so that was the first day okay i can see my boss again ashalala kazim is our mobile very big boss. So welcome, Kazim. We're happy to meet you. We're happy to um we're happy you are here to share a lot of your experience with us. Okay, so like I was saying, day two was about um the panelist session. My god, that was fully loaded. We had pressures, no, we had um AG school and Okay, Tim Sola. So it was packed with like it was a full package of awesomeness. Like I learned a lot of things. That was where we had the story about their um how they how they grew from how they started. Most of them added to rough. So like most of the experiences was was a motivation to me. So it really gave me motivation to keep going, to keep pushing. That even if today looks quite difficult and it doesn't look like okay um something is coming but but um i i i got the motivation that um i should not stop i should keep going so i know each of us have different experiences we have different takeaways from the event so um in the comment session we can just you can just tell me about how the two events have been like the first and the second the first day was about different people coming to tell us about their debugging experience the second day was unraveling their, their experiences so you can just tell me about your um takeaways from the two events to be so nice to hear so um while i was talking one of our boss joined that's carlo samuel is my big boss because he's into data science and machine learning is a um, um technically for data science and machine learning so welcome boss it can be here from you can we see everything you have loaded for us? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. It's really nice to be here. Yes. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. 
um before we start um okay let's just wait for a few minutes before we start program Okay, okay, okay. So, and today is going to be amazing. Out, like what we should be expecting from these tracks is going to be very, very amazing. And trust me, you you don't want to you don't want to miss it. So, um, we'll be we'll be starting with we'll be starting with our um mobile lead. Um, the technical is for the mobile development. So, um, little thing about him, his name is um, Ashalu Alaka's name. He's a third year student of computer science and he's, he's, the, he's a very amazing tech bro. Sincerely, he's someone that you really want to learn from. So, he's going to be unraveling different things about, um, he's going to be unraveling different things about mobile development, everything you need to know about mobile development. He's going to be talking to us about it, and trust me, you will learn so much from him. He's, he's fully loaded. He's loaded, and he's going to be unraveling different things for us. So um, let's let's sit tight and let's um, have him talk to us and lecture us about what mobile development is, how we can have our way around it, how we can move with it, and just like um, the basics of mobile development. So, um, Kazim, can we have you? All right. Um, good afternoon to you all. It's nice meeting you guys. Um, uh, thank you all for joining us today as we embark on our journey into the fascinating world of mobile app development. Yeah, it's a great, um, it's a special focus on Android. I am Shalom Atazi your guide for this exploration and together we we'll unravel the opportunities on the mobile development journey. So um, today I'll be introducing mobile or like app development to you guys. So what's the mobile um, app development? Mobile application development is the process of making software for smartphones, tablets, and uh, digital devices, most commonly for the Android and iOS operating systems. The software can be you know, installed on the device, uh, downloaded from mobile app store, like our Google Play Store for Android, or Apple Store for iOS, through a mobile 
um, web browser. So uh, in today's web driven era, mobile app development stands as a cornerstone of innovation. Uh, these pocket size applications have revolutionized the way we live, work, and, uh, and interact. From the end days of simple utility apps to the sophisticated solutions uh, we have today, the evolution of the mobile apps is testing to the dynamic nature of technology. So, based on what I have next, so can we move to the next slide? So, yeah, so this, this is what we will be going through today. So this is our table of contents. I've already introduced um, what mobile and development is. So next, I'll be uh, you know, telling you how to transition into Android development. I also introduce myself fully. I also uh, tell you the tools used in Android development, the levers of Android development, um, you know, in our economy, you know, in our day to day life, and also building thoughts and skills. So, Mr. Kareem, can we move to the next slide? You know, next. Yeah, yeah no, transition into under development. So, now, why Android? Why Android? That's a good question. So, with its expansive market uh, share and diverse user base, Android is not uh, just a platform, it's an ecosystem. So we we'll delve into the reasons why and the reasons behind <clears throat> choosing Android as our primary focus, comparing it with other platforms and understanding its pivotal role in shaping the mobile app landscape. So reasons for choosing Android development. Number one is market share and diversity. Android uh, boosts the largest market share in the mobile industry, reaching uh, a diverse and extensive user base globally. So under the market share and diversity, another point I want to um, you know, share is the, is the uh, variety of devices from budget smartphones to high-end tablets make makes Android development a versatile and plus, uh, inclusive endeavor to, you know, to venture into. So number two reasons for choosing Android development is open source and flexibility, right? So Android um, is an open source nature of uh, full stars of, um, of innovation. So like I, can, I could brag that Android is like is mainly open source. Even the, the OS itself is an open source like right? compared to iOS that is closed source. Right, so, uh, so the flexibility of the Android platform allows for creative exploration, accommodating a wide range of app functionality and design. As we all know, if uh, something is open source, that enables, you know, it's like it's it brings opportunities for other developers to you know, to contribute to um, to it, and also, um, you know, give it opportunity for I think I've already mentioned that. So then we move on to the third uh, reason why we should why we should also handle development compared to iOS. So, so even developer community. So the the vibrant and extensive develop uh, developer community around Android ensures the wealth of resources, support, and collaborative opportunities. You know, shared knowledge and open, and open communication within the Android ecosystem contributes to the continuous improvement of uh, of Android development practices. Yeah. Also, why on why we should choose Android? So let's compare Android with other platforms, right? So yeah. So let's compare Android with iOS, right? So. Android compared to iOS, I while iOS has its merits, it operates within a closed ecosystem, limiting device uh, limiting device uh, device diversity. So what I mean by limiting device diversity is, is that 
iOS itself is a closed source OS. I mean, operating system. You can't get access to iOS um, source code. You can't extend on it. You can't, like, compared to Android, that you can, you know, you have the uh, opportunity to build, like, to extend iOS. Right, so they are, we don't have much. I mean, iOS uh, developers don't have you know, those opportunities compared to iOS um, devs, right? So, development for iOS requires um, adherence to Apple's strict guidelines, providing a curated but more controlled user experience. Yeah, that is fine. iOS, they restrict, like, you know, they have so many guidelines, right? But Sometimes the restrictions can, you know, it can, um, how can I put it? It doesn't allow, it doesn't allow like developers to have more freedom, you know, to, you know, to customize the OS as they, they, as they would, right? So I think that's, uh, that's, that's a key point um, um, why Android is, you know, and development is far better than iOS development. So under, uh, Platform I would like to compare Android with is just platform solutions, which is not a um, React Native. So we all know that Android, building Android means that you are going you know, native, right? So Flutter and React Native are kind of an hybrid approach, you know, like a hybrid approach to building mobile apps, right? So for platform solutions offer code usability, but we sacrifice platform um, specific optimization. So why is not Flutter and um, or React Native, you know, as a um, as an option? They are great, but but sometimes you know, we need to, we want to assess uh, platform specific uh, components. Like you want to use uh, location service, you want to um, use Bluetooth and the likes, right? So if you want to like you know use those um, APIs, you might be restricted in one you know in one, in one or two ways so but using like you know interact like interaction with the native side of android i mean building native android apps allows you to have full control you know, full access direct access to to um to low api um to low, low api services so you're not restricted in any way i mean but with Flutter and reality you have to use like you know component bridge and some other you know, um, kind of like indirect way of interacting with those APIs, right? So I think I'm able to, you know, uh, mention the key points on that. So compared to other mobile platforms like, you know, Windows, mobile, I mean, that one is seven um, out of it. So the decline of alternative platforms makes Android and iOS the primary players we have also the, um, the strategic focus on Android the development. So in some way, uh, the decision to specialize in Android development is uh, is driven by the platform's market dominance. We have mentioned that uh, openness, open source, supportive community, that like a very like you know, vast uh, community, and seamless integration with new services. Right. So as an developer, you have like opportunities. You know, Google owns Android. By um, by default, that means you have like you know, full access to Google um, you know, services, you know, Firebase. Uh, you know, not to mention there are a lot of them out, uh, out there. So, yeah. So about myself, if I move on to the next slide, no, no, no. I mean about myself. No, I mean go back. Yeah, yeah, this one. So. So then, please allow me to introduce myself. I am Ashalama Kazim, your mobile technical lead here at EDS Lab, with a rich background in mobile app development and specialization in Android. I am excited to share my expertise and insights with you today. I currently uh, work at Frontend Labs as an Android developer. My role at FEL is to build uh, top-notch app, apps for mobile devices and TVs for our clients. So with the knowledge I've accumulated for the past four years in that in under development, I strongly believe I, that I can play my role diligently as the mobile technical lead and help aspiring developers to kickstart their journey. 
So let's embark on this learning journey together. All right, so we can move on to the next slide. So the tool we are using is Android development to build exceptional Android applications. We rely on the toolkits that empowers uh, developers. In any, in any developments, you will be required to use um, tools provided by you know, the, um, the OS you are building on. So, the demand, uh, like, sorry. So, in any developments, we use Android Studio as our official ID. Right? And what is, that? What is an ID? ID stands for Integrated um, uh, Development Environment. Right. So it starts as the creative space you know, complemented by the power of Kotlin as our programming language. So in other development in Android, um, you can either use Java. I mean I'm referring to the native side of Android. So you either use Java or Kotlin. But Kotlin is like you no know, Kotlin is not the official programming language for Android and that's what Google says. And more APIs are now you know, being built uh, using Kotlin, right? So, so we'll be using Kotlin um, in the course of our journey here uh, at, uh, at GPSC, right? So and that's what we use is Gradu. So Gradu is, um, Gradu is for seamless, uh, it's used to build an um, automation, right? So we use Gradu to, as an, as an automation tool, right, to compile our code. All right, so also we use uh, we are going to we use GitHub for version control too. So we also rely on Jetpack Compose or XML to build uh, user interfaces. So we are going to learn more um, later on in our next in our, in our upcoming event. All right, so let me just keep it short. So please, can we move on to the next slide? So relevance of Android development. So as we uh, as we navigate as we navigate the realm of Android development, it is crucial to understand its broader um, implications. The demand for Android developers is increasing by right? offering abundant careers opportunities. Uh, Android's dominance in the mobile market not only, contrib not only contributes to industrial trends, but also plays it's a vital role in shaping the global uh, technology la uh, landscape, right? So it contributes to the, um, you know, to our economy, right? I think, so as we all know, Android development is just, is just uh, isn't just about coding. It is um, it's the driving force for economic growth through job creation, um, app uh, monetization, you know, and innovation. So Android significantly impacts our economy, right? So as we explore this, uh, consider the ripple effects uh, it has on business, on businesses, employment, and the constant uh, match of technology uh, um, progress. Right? So, so it also helps, like, um, to, con to contribute to our personal use, right? So, if we shift our focus to the personal sphere, right? Android applications have become an integral part of our daily lives. You know, offering convenience, convenience, uh, convenience, um, accessibility, and customization. Like, I'm very sure we all like at some point in our life we have like for I'm referring to big guys here that use um, iPhone, I, um, iPhones. So uh, we we have used like you know, I'm very sure most of us are, uh, most of us are using Android devices, right? And in one way or the other, you need to use apps like you know, like you know, to get payments. You know, calculators and some other um, apps, right? So it's um, like it's a mix of productive in the sense that it's in line with most of the tasks we need to do manually ourselves, right? So let's now move on to the next uh, slide. Yeah, so closing thoughts and queries. So, yeah, our journey today has been a glimpse into the vast. World of mobile app development, with uh, Android taking the, the center stage. We have explored the two shaping our development process. We have also discussed the, the relevance of Android in the industry. And I said it's a profound 
uh, impact on both the economy and our personal life. So thank you for being part of this exploration. So before we conclude, I open the floor to any questions you may have, and please don't you know, bad me with questions. <laughs> and so you can feel free to reach out um, to me for further inquiries, and let's continue this conversation beyond this session. So thank you once again for your time and engagement. It's nice meeting you all. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Um, it was really, really nice. It was an insightful session. I was even convinced to start uh, mobile development, but you know, I can't. It was really, really nice. Your appreciation. Going right on to previous session, few people joined us. We had um, Israeli, um, Israel, 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 these are um, technical lead for um, product design and graphic design. And we also had to look there, which was which is a technical lead for um, back end development. But right now we're going into um the next stack, which is um cyber security. So which is cyber security and to be handled by um Omar Shalom. So let's have you um Omar Shalom. Um, almost shallow, my dear. Okay, it looks like he's not available right now. Yeah, I'm here. I'm almost here. Shallow, you... Yes, I'm here. I can hear you. I'm trying to share my screen. So, can you all see my screen? Yes, you can. All right. So, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. I'll be, like we all know, um, businesses, government organizations, and individuals make use of data and other personal information. So through these data and personal information, that's where um, cybersecurity comes in. So today I'll be talking about cybersecurity and um, introduction to cybersecurity. Why is cybersecurity important? The career paths, different career paths that are in cybersecurity, the ones that are technical and non-technical in cybersecurity and relevant tools used in cybersecurity. And lastly, I'll be sharing some resources for us to go through. So um, what is cyber of computer systems and data from attack or unauthorized access? And it is a complex and constantly involving field as attackers are always developing new methods of attacks. So um, cybersecurity is essential for business, like I said the other time. Cybersecurity is essential for business, government organizations, and individuals. And it shapes and it helps to protect valuable data and information system from theft, damage, and destruction. And cybersecurity on its own covers a wide range of activities and measures, which include defending against cyber attacks, um, ensuring the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data and information system. This is the important part of cybersecurity, ensuring the confidentiality, integrity, availability of data and information system. Also protecting the privacy of users and ensuring that the security of their personal information to are safe. And cybersecurity also prevents unauthorized access to systems and data. So this leads us to why cybersecurity is important. Cybersecurity is important to is important because it reduces the risk of cyber attacks and ensure that information systems are available and secure. 
say for instance for some organizations that deals with or big organizations that deals with um people's data confidential information and the like such as the banks and other organizations cyber security is important in that aspect to reduce the risk of cyber attacks and the reason why it is important is because because it will help to protect business data and systems, and also it protects personal information. And through that, cyber security also maintain the trust of people. And um, during cyber security, we have different parts in cyber security. There are actually many different parts that someone can take in the field of cyber security. We have the information security analysts. Um, there's a cyber security engineer, the penetration tester, incident responder, digital forensic specialist, risk analyst, the Cisco and cryptographer, the um, taking it step by step, information security analyst. These are their professionals that monitor networks and systems for potential security threats and they help to prevent attacks. So the work of an information security analyst is basically to like um, protect or prevent any attacks on a network. Then cybersecurity engineers, these are the people that um, implement and maintain cybersecurity system. They implement and um, maintain the systems of um, an, an organizations. We have the penetration testers. Yeah, I know most of people want to be a penetration tester and all. Well, actually, cybersecurity is not all about um, penetration testing and the likes. So penetration testers are testers that test are professionals that actually test systems for vulnerabilities and they identify ways that they could that they could be exploited by attacker. So a penetration tester um, tests systems for vulnerability and find a way or they try to exploit a way in which an attacker can use to gain it to the system. And also we have um, the incident responder, yeah. The incident responders, these are professionals. They, they are actually responsible for like responding to and investigating any security incident in an organization or business, such as a data breach and um, information security leak. And going towards the digital forensic specialist, um, these people actually um they are, they are use specialized tools and techniques actually to uh, analyze digital evidence and they identify potential criminals the risk analyst also assess risks to the assess risks of an organization information system and they actually recommend ways to mitigate those risks moving forward we'll be talking about the technical and the non-technical aspects like we all know, cybersecurity has various parts in in it. So we have the technical and the non-technical aspect. So the technical aspect deals with um, the network security, the application security, cloud security, mobile security. Also deal with the penetration testers and the likes. So the network security. Um, make them secure networks. Application also secure the application apps and we have the non-technical aspect yeah this um technical aspect includes the physical security we have the security policy and procedures and we have the training and awareness this is actually important in cyber security well in the case of physical security the physical security measures include um, the access controls and the protect physical assets such as um, computers and buildings. Um, security policies, these are rules and regulations that governs the use of information systems. So they include such as um, policies, implementing of creating policies and implementing policies, include password policies, incident response plan, and training and awareness. Yeah, this is the very important part of cybersecurity program. It helps employees, not only employees, it helps employees, stakeholders, and organizations to understand the rules in keeping systems and data secure. So security trainings also goes a long way in 
um, helping cyber security. And security changes include topics such as the phishing awareness, data protection, the use of Wi Fi, and the likes. And I'll be taking you through the tools and software used in cyber security. We have a lot of tools and software used in cyber security. A penetration tester has tools they use. Um, a SOC analyst has tools they use. A SOC analyst actually defend um, organization network or system. So they have a tool they use for that. And each and every other part in cyber security has a tools they use. So the tools used in cyber security Includes penetration testing tools such as uh, Metasploit, Perpsuit, Nmap, and Nessus. So these tools are used to simulate real world cyber attacks to identify vulnerabilities in systems and network. I'll be going through the security information and event management tools, which is the SIEM tool. These tools actually collect and analyze log data from a variety of systems to identify security incident we have the vulnerability scanner tools which are used to scan systems for known vulnerabilities mostly used by the penetration testers and um, the risk assessment people so the scan system for known vulnerabilities such as missing security patches or misconfigurations and um, examples of vulnerability scanners include the quails the nessus Opuvas and the like. So we have password manager for uh, most of us that has different accounts. And instead of us making use of a particular, um, a particular, like making use of a particular password for all our social media accounts, so we can use various or different kinds of password and storing them on the password manager. A password manager will help you store different passwords you use for your different accounts. Then there is the encryption, which encrypts data, and we in which um, an outsider cannot get access to except you give the person access to the encrypted file. Then there is firewalls and there is antivirus software. So below are the resources that we can use for the penetration testers. There's a try hack me, hack the box, the bug bounty. For cyber security, we have the Cisco Networking Academy. For the web app penetration testing, we have the OAPS Juice Shop, we have the Bot Trigger. And for the cloud security, you can go through the AWS Security Hub, the Azure Security Center, the Google Security, um, Cloud Security, and um, other resources are available out there. So these are a few of the resources. So I hope you understand what cyber security is all about so if there's going to be if you have a question you would like to ask a recommendation you can go through it thank you for having me shalom um i have a very short question okay so i attended a session on cyber security all right. Speaker was talking about how important um, um, password on our Wi Fi. I couldn't get important because someone like me, I don't like putting um, um, passwords so that like when I turn on my OSCO, I'm turning it on to certain people. So I'm going to connect to my password. And when I'm done, then we were talking about something like. Um, um, some virus can be able to penetrate. Yeah, uh, attackers make use of various ways. Like I said, it's a social engineering attack. So they make use of various ways to get through people, such as using phishing. Down the phishing means um, email. So for the um, Wi Fi, you're turning on your Wi Fi uh, without putting password. So you have given everybody the right to make use of your wi-fi and through that process you don't know an attacker might be lucky to gain access to most of your credentials using your wi-fi so that's why man, putting passwords on your wi-fi is very important because without that a lot of people can penetrate through any of your documents using your wi-fi and get 
informations that you yourself do not give out. So it is important to put password. In fact, not only password, if you have um, a two-factor authentication, you are also expected to make use of two-factor authentications in order to prevent um, any attack. I'm not saying it's, um, it's a solution to it, but prevention is better than cure. So to be on the safer side, you have to like put on um, passwords on any of your accounts or any of your Wi-Fi you are making use of. Okay, so thank you so much, ma'am. The session was very amazing. The talk was so nice. So we um we've learned how to be security conscious. Yes. Okay, so thank you so much for the session. So now we're moving on to our um data science and machine learning lead. We have um Samuel Kalu. Please can you um enlighten us about what data science and machine learning is. So over to you, Samekali. Can I share my screen? I'm good evening. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So let me open this slide, okay? All right, I think we yeah, we are good to go. Okay. So good afternoon. I'm Samuel Kalu, and I'm the I'm the technical lead DDSC for the machine learning slash data science track. So we'll be starting off. So let's enter the second slide. So now we're we'll doing a brief introduction to machine learning and data science. So let's 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 look through the outline. So now our first topic, the brief overview of data. So now what is data? I think like for our our like basic idea of what data is. Data is oh uh, yeah, oh it was data. Data are raw facts. Data are raw facts. They could be in any format, audio, video, images even raw text, any, any format, they are raw facts, that's data. So now, that brings us to the second topic, data science. So now, what is data science? Data science is what? It's the study, or rather, I should call it a series of, a series of, pra of practices or processes where we use data to kind of like gain insights towards, an, towards, a, towards a solution, a task, or, to, or, or in general, to understand the problem, right? So now, let's, let's, I want to give you a very good example. Okay, let's, let's do it this way. You own a store, right? And you say, what, what is it called? You say, let's say you sell biscuits and sweets or whatever. And you're try, you trying to kind of like figure out whether the prices of all these things will actually increase over a period of time, right? So now, you can, you can collect data from your past sales, your inventory, and, 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 what, and whatnot, right? So now, if you're able to figure out, like, based on the past increment in prices, you're able to figure out the future prices, it kind of helps you to kind of prepare and, and gives you an edge over your competition. So that's basically, you are using data to gain an edge over the rest of the competition. Right? So that's kind of like a layman definition of data, what data science entails. So now, that, now that, why data science? I think, I, I, think I, I just kind of like covered part of this question now. So now data science is important because it kind of helps us understand understand everything. See, I, I, I want to exaggerate it a bit. Okay, it helps us understand everything in the world, right? Everything you can see is data. You walking on the road, you can be considered data. You 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 making a transaction, you playing football, you do you doing any any form of activity can be considered. You, you are kind of like making a make, making a. Okay. What, what is it called? It's called, I think it's called digital footprint or something. That, that, that's basically it. 
But I think we'll, we'll be going forward like what, what data, what like we'll, you'll see more more examples of this along on along these lines. Don't worry. So now, what are data scientists? Data scientists are people who practice data science. So the art, the art of data science, they practice it. They help businesses, individuals, organizations to kind of like implement and you kind of like use their data to to generate value. That's the best definition I come up with. Okay. So now I've explained what they do just now. So now, what are the main courses in data science and machine learning? So, data science and machine learning, they are used interchangeably. So, understandably, is a very large field. That's the truth. So now, data science and machine learning, the main courses, it originates from math. So we have statistics, we have probability. Then we have data analytics, whereby we use tools like Power BI, our, what, what's it called? Our Tableau, our Excel, to kind of like make, to kind of like make charts, plots, and kind of like simple statistical analysis for our data, right? That's data analytics. Then we have data engineering. These data engineers, they kind of like make, make pathways for things like data leaks, data like, they are kind of like people involved in making sure data is available for everybody. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know that, that definition is on point, but that is what data engineers, they, they, work, they work very, very closely with data. They work into in data business, Things like, uh, what's it called? I think SQL, Apache. They work very, very close to data. That's data engineers. So now we come to data scientists. Data scientists are, I would say, they encompass a lot of fields. Firstly, they encompass data analytics because they have to understand business problems. They, they, have, they also have to do a little bit of machine learning. So they have to provide business with values in that. Also, they, they do things like, uh, what should I call it? Reporting. They report back to stakeholders and business and the business owners. And yeah, there's some, there's some other things they also do too. Well, a lot. So now let's move into the machine learning engineers. So now that the machine learning engineers, these people are involved in what productionizing models. Like they deal with like the models itself. They, they, they do everything from actually like um, doing hyperparameter optimization, things like find things like what what's it called? Things like model model deployment, things like cloud, cloud management. They, they do things like versioning, control. They share, they handle the models. They are, they are basically the one, the closest people to the models. So that's that. I think there's the other fields too. I don't think they are, they are this, I think the four I mentioned are like the main, the main courses in data science and machine learning. So I think I, I should move on. So now, the next slide. Okay. Our data sources around us. So now you can see lots of data is being collected and warehoused. So we have our web data, e-commerce, Financial transactions, bank credit, online trading, social networks, like that. So now, see, yeah, see, in the world, whatever you do, like this is social media, whatever you're doing on social media, they, they are collecting the time in one way or another. Like Facebook, Facebook, Facebook is probably collecting your use time, your average use time. They are collecting it. The, the post you like, they are collecting it. Your comment, like every 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 little every little interaction you make or make on a social media app is most likely collected. So let's let's move on. I think we'll see more about that. Just hold on. Okay. Now, yeah, this is what I'm waiting for. So now, how much data do we actually have? So now, this this first information. And let me. I think we have to blow our mind a little bit. Google processes what twenty petabytes a day, and this was at two thousand and eight to twenty petabytes. So now, to give you a little bit of context to to how to how large a petabyte, just one petabyte is. So now you know like you you know how, how large a gigabyte is. Right, a thousand twenty-four megabytes. A gigabyte can actually like contain like let's say, on average, one high-quality movie, a Netflix movie or something like that. That's a giga. That's a, that's a gigabyte. So now, the one higher than gigabyte is what a terabyte. So imagine a gigabyte, one thousand twenty-four times. Right, over a thousand times. That's one terabyte. You have not reached petabyte yet too. So now petabyte is not a terabyte. A thousand twenty-four times. So now we have twenty of this AD. And that was at 2008. So now, this currently is going to be way higher than this. So that's like how, that's just giving you context to how large data we actually have in the world. Of Google, Google alone actually. Still look at this, Facebook, Facebook possesses 60 terabytes. 60 terabytes is what? It out, like, see that 60 multiplied by what? 1,024. For some of us that are computer science students here, you understand that better. So now, eBay, 6.5 petabytes, almost this. Almost this. This, this one is in total plus 50 AD. So that's 109. 
So you can imagine if, if you have the kind of amount of data at, at, at before pre 2010, when, when we see we are, we are having invented things like um where deep learning models and all these what what are they called early methods haven't been invented yet. So now oh this other project genome two hundred terabyte okay. All, all these are like how expensive data is to actually store. We have a single terabyte cost about $35 to, store, to use, right? And I think this should be one terabyte. I think I think, we, I think the read speed should be actually faster than this currently. But yeah, 100 MB per second to actually read, read with this. A hard drive, I believe. So I think let's move on to the next slide. So data is the new oil. You might have seen this before, like if you anything like data is new oil, like data scientist is, is the best job of the 21st century, something like that. Yeah. So now I, I think I should be able to zoom in to this. Okay, let me zoom in. Oh, I can't zoom in. Uh, how, how am I going to zoom in? Zoom, 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 zoom. Okay, yeah. So I, I don't know if you're supposed to see, to see all these things that are, that are written in small text. But now look at this data is new oil. Look, look at look at all, all, all this this should I call it displacement? All this disparate. Huh? What's the word? English hard, English very hard. Don't worry. Okay, look at all this distribution. Ah, come on. Okay. Look at everything. We have seven billion DVDs. We have what's it called? 247 billion images, right? Emails, sorry. 133 million blogs. Four million. What's it called? I can't see this properly. We have a lot. So a lot and a lot of a lot and a lot of data. We can't even quantify it properly. There are a lot of a lot of smaller texts that haven't been quantified properly. That's the, how large. And this this data is continuously growing. Like as we are, I'm talking to you now, more data is being poured in, in, into the internet. Even the, what, like what this this meeting we are on now is actually being recorded, or rather YouTube is actually collecting it into their into their database. It's going there. Google Meet, we are interacting. It's going like that. They are collecting the data. So let's move on. Am I going to look on to this slide? Yeah, slide seven. Let me zoom out a bit. Okay. Yes. Now, types of data we have. We have relational data. It's about tables, transaction, and legacy legacy data. Legacy should be, I think, old like old archive data, probably stored in tables and stuff. Okay. So now we have text data. It's like the the, the shiniest new thing that everybody wants to go into now. Text data, all these language models and shit. Okay. Now. We have our semi-structured, our XML files. These are used for things like I think they be design, designs and structures of I think this should be this should be more mobile applications and stuff. It's also useful, it's actually very useful, XML files. We have our graph data. So graph data is useful in I think medicine, geography, and some, some other some other things. Yeah. So now our social network, what I was discussing about Facebook, Instagram, and yeah, and, and the likes. We have streaming data from your Netflix, YouTube. These are, oh shit. These are videos from videos. So let's move on. Slide it. So now, use uses of collected data. We have aggregation of statistics. So now, <clears throat> I don't think this is an interesting topic. Okay, no worry, I'll discuss about it anyways. So we have statistics. Statistics is basically, it's the nearest US in Among Us. That is probably the use, the use of mathematical method in quantifying data. So basically, you have your beyond. I think we are familiar based statistics. Your mean, median, mood, standard deviation, variance, yeah, and the likes. So that's basically a great. That's basically basic statistics. Let's go into this. I think this, this is very interesting. I think I enjoy this topic. Okay. Indexing, searching, and querying. So now, you you have you have all used ChatGPT, right? Right. So now, if you if you enter a text into ChatGPT, ChatGPT does it does it, it it does like a pipeline. Which is which is used to kind of like draw inference from what you just give it. Now, the first step it does it was to break your text into tokens. It's called tokenization, right? So now, after it does that, it indexes each each token in your text. It indexes it. After indexing it, right, it takes each token and search performs a search with those IDs more along its like neurons in the network. Oh wait. Yeah, I don't know. In so now, it is what you have to understand is there are, there are a lot of different approaches in, in actually training all these large models. Some some models, I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm going too far because so, some models actually use searching. 
some used querying. So now, the difference between searching and querying that I can't really tell you off the bat, off, off the top of my head. But querying is a faster, querying is faster than searching. Querying is way faster. I don't know. This, this topic is topic. Okay, okay. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on. Okay. Knowledge discovery, data mining is actually looking for lots and lots of data. And we have statistical modeling too. Probably very, 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 very close to that. Let, let's move on. This is a boring, this is a very boring, boring pitch. Okay, data science explained. Okay, is the science which is computer science, statistics, machine learning to interact with humans and collect information. I think the, sorry, I think this was a mistake. This is probably supposed to be one, one of the earlier pages. So now, data science is a multidisciplinary field. This go to us address uh, challenges in big data. So now, I, I think I, I've given some insight to what big data is. Big data is it, data is so large that we can we can't even start start collect start analyzing them off the bat like. We can't, we can't even start imagining it. Like, I, I told you that as we are talking now, tons and tons of petabytes have been like generated every second that we are actually talking. So now, data science principle applies to all data, big and small. Next slide, slide 10. Okay. What? Uh, okay, okay. I, I, I think this, this is probably a, a misarrangement of my slides on my end. Okay. Theories and techniques from many fields and disciplines are applied to investigate and analyze large amounts of data to help decision making in many industries that are science, engineering, and so on, right? So now let's visit this what do you call it? This field. The most common use of data science is computer science, obviously, since we use it for things like pattern recognition, machine learning, data visualization, warehousing, and high performance computing, right? So now in mathematics. We use it for mass, mass modeling. I think numerical modeling to some other things like that. So now we have statistics. Statistics is just another common use case for things like okay, stochastic modeling, probability, statistics, and so on. Right, so let's move on to the next page. All right, so now what can you do with the knowledge of data science? So now this is a first use, traffic prediction and ethnic warming, warning rather. So now, Tra in, let, let, let's treat traffic prediction first of all. Yo, we all we all know Google Maps, right? I think we all have, we all have mobile phones. Okay. Sorry, I should speed it up a little bit. Okay, we all have mobile phones for traffic prediction. Basically, Google Maps kind of collect location data from every single user and predict. What should, should I say predict? I kind of maps it to, with every other user. Mm, yeah, kind of like they, they have they have the information of every user they map it they map from every user every user it together ethnic warning okay ethnic warning is interesting so any ethnic warning actually uses sensing he use this so now we have the there's something in your phone called gyroscopes if you have heard of it so ethnic warning uses uses those gyroscopes to kind of like make make collect a form of data and make it available to you and uh, let's move on let's move on data science versus machine learning okay you might have heard this comparison a lot of times. But now, as I said, data science uses business problems. Like, it's very closer to business problems. Machine learning involves more mathematical and technical knowledge, right? So now, you can you read, read machine learning developing individual models. Data science explores many models, right? If this one proves, okay, let me, let me zoom improve mathematical properties of models. This one understand empirical properties of models, right? This one improve and validate on new small data sets. This one develops tools that can do massive data sets. Okay. And that's that, that's that. Okay. I think I also hand over to my colleague to continue from this, this point onwards. I think, um, what's his name? Ayo, can you take over? Is he on the call? Yeah, I think he has left the call. All right, don't worry. I'll proceed with this. So, domain knowledge. This is the. Okay. Let's explain that. I, I, I think this, I think this, might, this is my part. Though. Okay. Data science is multidisciplinary, right? So it involves a lot and lots of processes, from business, pattern recognition, statistics, data business, machine learning, neural computing. A lot and lot of fields. Go to our next page. This is basically about the same thing too. 
data engineering, like this is these are the fields that engine data science, right? Move on. So this is the real real life examples of data science. Companies learn your secrets, your patterns, your preferences, like what I was talking about. For example, now if your woman is pregnant, even she doesn't want us to know. Google Google knows. This this like a this like this was like something that made the news some, some years back. Like how the recommender system actually figured out that your mom was pregnant. Okay, this is what data science and election. Look at this now. One million people installed the Obama Facebook app that gave access to info on friends. This, this, this is an example of powerful recommendations using AI again. You can, you can easily cause things like election rigging. These are some risks of AI. Sure. Let's move on. So now look at this. Data scientists, the sexiest job of the 21st century. Okay, define stories, extract. Extract knowledge, they are not reporters. This, this, this was a very popular news, I think, if a few years back. That should be 2021. That people were actually talking about data science, data science, data science. When we, I don't think they are completely wrong, but yeah, there are some twists to it. Okay, now, data scientists, they are the key to realizing opportunities presented by big data. They bring structure, find compelling patterns, and advise things like business stakeholders and executives on these product process and decision, decision makings. The way all this business like yeah the entire process is good right so now let's move on what do data scientists do we have national security cyber security business analytics engineering like see to be honest data scientists can, can work anywhere like forget this nigerian talk with, like <laughs> this work anywhere like the, the, the only like the only thing that i can actually work anywhere is actually data scientists like forget what they tell you you study english language can work anywhere like this one is actually is actually kind of true data science Look at this in football. People play ball. They collect data about like the, the score, the player scores, the, the like the player hit map, like their, their activity on the field. A lot of different things. The color of boots they wear, when they can collect it. Like that, like that. That's how powerful it is. They can literally, they can literally work anywhere as far as their data to be collected. So let's move to the next slide. Okay, nineteen. You're almost done. So now courses in data science and machine learning. We have mathematics. I think we. we I think most people. Or, or already realized that you need this for machine learning mathematics you can't avoid it that's that so now you need apply statistics i mean apply statistics you need things like let's say basic knowledge about i said new media most standard standard deviation variance and something like i think t-square and over just just on basic you know you don't really need to go in deep deep so now we have solid programming skills either, either you, we can learn any of these languages but the two i'll suggest is what python and sql Others are important, but most times Python SQL will get, will get the job done most of the time. So now we have data mining. This is looking for large amounts of data from, from places that are hidden or something like that. So now we have database storage and management. D or DBMS. Where we manage all these people's databases. And we have machine learning that I have discussed earlier. So now, question. Any questions? Hello? Can you guys hear me? Hello? Any question? Um, no, there's no question. Thank you very much for this session. Okay. This was very, very insightful. You can get in touch. My name is my humble self, Samuel Kalu. Thank you very much. Let me close the call. Okay, so thank you very much. It was really nice having you to talk about data science and machine learning. Thank you so much. So um you can when you have um those that have questions for those that have questions for each of the sections and just drop them in our comment session. We'll have them we'll have them after the after each session so you can drop your comments or your questions on the session or the comment session. So um Next, we have um, the is our um, technically for um, product design and graphic, and graphic. So, um, is your advisor as we Okay, so 
Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Agbaje Israel, and I'm the technical lead for UIX Design and for GDSC FUNAB. So I'm going to take you through what UIX Design is all about. Just an introductory um, section of what it's about and what you are going to do throughout the session. So I'll be sharing my screen now. Okay, so let's start. So I'm the co-lead, like I said before, I'm the co-lead at Bad Israel, and my co-lead is um, Ayola Tosin. So it's the co-lead for the UI design track or design track. So now let's go into what UI design is all about. So what is UI design? So UI UX design refers to the process of creating user interfaces and user experiences for digital products and services, such as websites, mobile apps, software applications, and more. And the goal of UI UX design is to enhance the usability, accessibility, and aesthetic appeal of the product, ensuring that users have a positive and intuitive experience while interacting with it. So, we are going to look into what UI design is because we have two um, parts, UI design and UX design. So UI design is also known as user interface design. That's the full name, user interface design. And that has to do with the visual representation of what of your product, whether it's an app, a website or anything, what you see, the colors and every other thing. Okay, so UI design focuses on the visual elements, like I said before, of a digital product, including the layouts, how everything is arranged, text, um, shapes, everything, pictures, colors, typography, icons, and other graphical elements. And the primary objective is to create an attractive and visually engaging interface that aligns with the brand's identity and resonates with the target audience. And um, UI design has considered factors such as layouts like i said before so layout means organizing the content and elements on the screen in a logical and easy to understand manner so you have to consider your users and make it very easy for them to understand your products so next one is colors and typography so that means selecting appropriate colors and fonts that are visually appealing and enhance readability then we have icons and images Creating or selecting icons and images that convey meaning and improve navigation. So you have to use image that relates with what the product is all about. So they'll be able to understand and icons that they'll be able to recognize easily. So responsiveness, the next one. So enjoying the interface is adaptable to different devices and screen devices. So for those into programming, I'm sure you all know what responsiveness is all about. So be able to design as a UI designer, you must be able to design for different screens, whether tablets, phone, desktop, or watch or watch designs or any size. So now I'm going to look into user experience design. That's UX design. So UX design focuses on the overall experience users have while interacting with a digital product and involves understanding user behavior preferences and needs to design intuitive and seamless experiences. So I'm going to look at the factors considered for UI designers. So the first one is user, recha user research. So user research means conducting research to understand the target audience, their pain points and their goals. So before you embark on a project, you must have done, you must make sure you have done some research about the products. People who have used the product before, or people who have not used a product before, what they expect from the product and how they expect it to behave. So the next one is information architecture. It means organizing and structuring the content and functionalities to make it 
easy for users to find what they need. The next one is interaction design. It means defining how users interact with the product, such as through buttons, menus, and gestures. So for example, there are different uh, features on apps, interactive features, something like, for example, let me use something like Instagram, Instagram or LinkedIn. There are some pictures that or videos you just be scrolling through. And you know, we have like button, we have a comment section, or you can share something. So interaction like double clicking on the image or the video, once you double click on it, it's going to and bring out you're going to like the picture automatically so it's one of the um, functionality um, gestures or functionalities making it easier for the user to like making it easier for the user to like um, a post or let's say something like whatsapp now so every day we have a um, new features coming out on whatsapp and the new features are to make the new features are to make it very easy for users to um, to relate to the products and if users cannot relate to the product they drop a complaint and the product and the people who own the products they try to meet the needs of the users so let's go to next one is then um, prototyping and testing so creating interactive prototypes and conducting usability testing to gather feedback and refine the design so prototype just means a real life representation of your products so for example let's say you're working with a developer or you're with a team i want to show them let's say i've been on an app now i want to show them the flow from one page to another or what a button does or functionality of an element there so you just show them and everyone views at the same time so just that representation so let's continue so why you should go into your ux design why you should go into UI UX design? Okay, so the first one is um, problem solving. So UI UX design allows you to be a problem solver. You identify challenges that users face and work creatively to design solutions. Then number two is creativity. If you enjoy creative thinking and envisioning new concepts, product design or UI UX design provides, provides an outlet for your imagination. It's a field that encourages innovation and thinking outside the box. So it was the same here that you must be very creative. I must be able to think outside the box. Design is not an easy task. You have to think before you won't think of designing your products. You have to think of how the layouts will be, the colors you use, and other things, especially your components. Then users is user-centric. So UI designers are focused on creating products that enhances the user experience. If you are interested, if you are interested in understanding one behavior and designing for the needs of users, this is a rewarding field. So you are your design is a field that you can go into. So diverse opportunities. So your design is applicable across various industries, from technology and healthcare to fashion and transportation and other industries to whether it can be fintech or any other thing. So this diversity means you can work on a wide range of projects. Their impact. Successful product design has the potential to make a significant impact on people's life. It can improve efficiency, enhance experiences, and even contribute to sustainability efforts. Then another reason why you can why you should go into UI design because they're in high demand. People need them every day. If you go online or websites where people apply for jobs, you see a lot of applications or vacancies for UI design. So as business increasingly recognize the importance of UI experience, there's a growing demand for skilled UI UX designers across various industries. So now we are going to look at the rules of a UI UX designer. We are going to look at the rules. Okay, so as, as I've seen before, user research, that means understanding the needs, behaviors, and preferences of target audience. Information architecture, we have looked at it before, wireframing and prototyping. Like I said before, creating visual representations of the product structure and functionality. The yeah, visual design, applying the aesthetic layer to create a visually pleasing and consistent user interface. Like I said before, what you can see physically. Then usability testing, collecting feedback and iteratively refining the design based on user testing. 
So before you launch, after you build the products, before you launch it, you have to give it to some people, maybe developers or some stakeholders to test. Then they give feedback. Then they make the corrections before the product is eventually launched. The next one is brand consistency. So maintain a consistent visual language that aligns with the brand. Then conversion optimization, improving the likelihood that users will take desired actions within the products. So the products must be able to combat users. So, okay, I, I look at the problem solving, addressing user pain points and providing effective solutions. All the feedback, the products, what they feel can be added, things that make them uncomfortable while using the products or give them trouble while trying to navigate around it. So we have some tools and software we use for design. So as you all know, the main one that is very popular is Figma. Everybody uses Figma. Then the other ones like Adobe XD, Sketch, then Photoshop and Illustrator. They are just, they are also design tools also. You can use it to create some designs that you can use in your projects, in your Figma projects. Then prototype, prototype, just like a prototyping tool. Where you can do your and you can create them prototypes as if you don't use it on Figma. So, so in conclusion, in modern UI UX design, the focus is on creating user centered experiences that prioritize user usability and accessibility. It involves designing for different users, construing users with disabilities, and incorporating user feedback throughout the design process. UI designers often collaborate with other team members, such as product managers, developers, and stakeholders to ensure the final product meets both business goals and user needs. Iterative design processes are common. UI designs are continuously refined based on user feedback and data analysis to create the best possible user experience. So like I've said before, you are designing for different users. You are designing for um, different users, whether they have disability, and or any other challenge and you must be able to listen to them when they give you feedback so you can make corrections to the project and um, to the products so you can make corrections to the product so as not to affect it in future okay so is there any any question do you have any question okay so please if you have any question you can just comment on the um chat section for you to have it there. So thank you very much, Israel Baji. So it's a very nice session and we learned yeah. a lot about um UI UX. So thank you so much. So any question questions will be up um, accepted on the chat section. So please let's do well to ask our questions. Any anything about any of the sessions and just put your question out there and attend to it as soon as we see them. So now we'll be going into the um, back end development track. So um our technical lead for the back end development for GPS is Adi Kupi Tululope. So we'll have him talk about um the um back end development and how we can navigate through everything we need to know about it as a beginner or as someone who is interested in it. So let's have you to rule okay. Oh, sorry, I was muted. I hope you all can see me. Yes, you can. Okay. Yes, yeah, so um, my name is Tulok and I'm the back end lead for GDSC Bonab. And my co lead is um, Adimeji Michael. And basically, I'm a full stack engineer. And I'm basically, I'm going to be walking through what back end development basically is and what you can do with it. So, back end basically it involves basically the things that happen behind the scene that you all don't see just like when you use your mobile apps your web apps like when you click on a button the things that happen like let's say you're trying to make a payment on the website after inputting your card details 
will be redirected to a page. So the process that goes on from directing to a page to deducting of accounts, deducting of money from a bank account is basically for backend based. So there are other use cases for backend based too. So I'm going to be walking through what backend based development basically is, what it involves, what it entails, the process behind it, uh, what it can be used for, and also the job opportunities that are open to backend developers. Yeah, so um, like I said before, backend basically is a behind the scenes of part of the app, just like your mobile app. Like the, I'll say backend is basically the powerhouse of all applications that we have today. You have even for data science, um, the data science team is the backend person to provide the data they need. Like when say somebody comes onto our app to let's say register on an application, like the inputting and submission of those data for it to go to the database. It was basically involves backend, and also it involves basically. I can say backend is also an algorithm, more like a step by step instruction you give to a computer. And backend basically are stored in a server, and it basically involves like basically helps in, basically involves in saving of important data, and it basically connects um the interface of an application to the back to the database and other backend systems. Just like you having a, an application, you can connect another application. Like together using backend and basically backends like servers work with um, API so you, you connect to each other using APIs and API is basically application programming interface and so and it also includes um like I said before backend is basically the server it basically includes a server a physical storage tab also it also involves database also file storage yeah so um backend developments basically involves building a system capable of storing, pressing, and tracking the data. So the the press the process behind the building of those like algorithms that you write, like the storing of data, the pressing of data, tracking of data, also the Google Meet we on now is still the work of backend. Even though uh, like let me, let me even use let me use on um, WhatsApp for example, you all use WhatsApp here. So when you like when you put like okay you make it more sense to the user or just it to your friend or your mom or dad or anyone will send message to. After clicking on send, before it goes to database, a lot of things happens. Let's say, for example, an encryption is being done before data is being sent so the hackers cannot get access to the data. Like the press behind getting the data and putting the database still is back in. And the server actually makes sure that you actually send the message. The message you're sending actually goes to the right person. Imagine now you're trying to send a message to someone and it goes to another person. It won't actually make sense. So backend actually like helps you like know exactly where you actually send that message to. And also you as users are engaging with the app, actually send and receive messages and all of that. So it involves the processes, the database, the algorithms that you the algorithms that happen, and also the user and guy actually engaging with the app. It does not only involve the um, user. You can, can just use another example of um, the way automation systems have been done. Let's say, let me use the work of um, AI. Like the whole aspect of AI, the way that they process data, like guess, actually knows what you're actually doing, still involves backend. So AI, AI, ML engineers still, are still, I still, I still basically backend engineers. So uh, basically, a backend developer is somebody that involves um, that time writes the um, business logic, and logic is same as algorithms, and basically uses um, specific technology tools such as um, I know you have a set of um, C, C, the C family, like C plus plus, C sharp, even PHP, Python, GoLang, and the rest. And also involves tools like um, um, let's see, also basically involves a lot of tools. Let me put it that way. So and a lot of back-end development tools um, involve um, IDs, and IDs are basically examples of Microsoft, Microsoft Visual Studio, and not to be confused with Visual Studio Code. Microsoft Visual Studio is more like a environment for specific languages, so, such as C Sharp. It's basically, it's basically more like a, an environment for only a specific language. So you cannot run other languages in IDs. Examples are also PHP Storm, so only for PHP, Python, only for Python, and so much more. And Microsoft Visual Studio Code is only for C Sharp and .NET um, applications. So and also it, it also uses um, text editors. Um, examples of text editors, I'll say one example is a Notepad that we normally use on our laptop. Notepad is an example of text editor, 
But the only difference between Notepad and other things is that you have just that Visual Studio Code, the brand text. The only difference that there is that back end those um those um highlighting of um errors in your code, like looking those colors that I see, they are not in all these Notepad and legs. We also use terminals, and terminals is actually a major part of backend development. So, like, we are no like examples like Linux, like Linux, for example, now, like sometimes you only interact with um terminals, like, you know, like CMD, for example, command prompt. You need to write some code, let's say to install a particular, um, a particular package, a particular application, all of those things. You still work with that. Also, servers, for example, Apache is actually an example of um, a PHP server. Um, Nginx, Nginx can actually run like multiple languages. Uh, but Apache is basically for um, PHP. So on um, databases too, like I said before, you used to study data. So after getting the data that you have tried to like do the whole algorithm behind it, like SQL, NoSQL, MongoDB, Postgres, and so much more. Even um, there are a lot of backend um, databases, and basically that way, the old the old data you have been you are saving on your particular application, they are collecting from your user. That's where it goes to. So that's how it, that's how it remembers that okay, it is you that are logging into an application. So that the database is actually the, the biggest. Like no, no, like, I don't say it's, it's basically one one important aspect of backend development. So I'm um, basically like like I said before, backend development is basically about writing of algorithms, a step by step instruction you give to your computer. Just like for example now, if I form a code operation, code operation basically involves creating, reading, obviously, and deleting of data. And that involves basically, and that involves with that basically involves interaction with databases. So let's say now you're trying to like get into an application now. You come onto the app, I want to like create a data. Let's say you want to store something in data. After the getting of those data and storing is what you call creating. After storing that data, we need to be to want able to okay, know that okay, it is you that trying to take the data. Like get reading that data out of the database is what we call read. Updating, let's say now you let's say let me use an example of like your WhatsApp, your profile depend your display picture on WhatsApp. For example, now you have your display picture there, you want to update it. Like after it's one well, like after you click on upload on this WhatsApp, it actually like changes. The picture that you actually put there and that involves the data but you know, like change the URL or where the picture is being stored and all those things you want to call your dating and you want to delete that particular data or you want to clear it up do not see it again that is what the it does the it does everything with the database and also um we also call we also have something we call like server paging like serving pages for to a client let's now the common thing common an application now Let's say now you want to like process a password data for this. Let me use process password data. Let's say it just says okay. Let me use an example of a mobile application for let's say payment for banks. You come onto the app, you say you want to do a transaction. Like after you click on make transfer, you there's an input box that says okay, input the amount you want to send. You input the amount you want to send and click on send. After you click on send, the whole thing is happening behind the scene. That actually gets that actually sends and the response you get okay is yes you actually made a transfer which actually the confirmation part of it and is what gets sent to the client side which is the application that you see what you see in the different application the old the things that have been behind the scenes what's called server side rendering and the the old um, things that happen in front of the application things that you see what's called client side rendering so anything that happens server side cannot be seen anything that that can be done in the clients that can be seen. So that's one way to differentiate between it's a front end and back between front end and back. So front end basically involves developing all these buttons, text, and all of that. It also involves like front end still consists is still under I say um is mobile development still under front end in this that way. But now that we see that mobile development is moving to a more advanced stages, to more advanced stages, we have basically front end basically moving it's basically advancing in terms of like APIs or connecting with APIs, doing a lot of things on the front end, like using React, which is a front end framework, or um, using Flutter for mobile, and so things that we can see. So, and also automated systems. Let's, like, I know most also, some of you have noticed that, okay, there's, 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 there's actually a particular time that animated is being sent to you. Do now it happens. 
let's say you don't subscribe let's say you subscribe to an application let's say subscribe to netflix for example now like you some of you would think that okay maybe it's in netflix i send that data to you like send send your mind out to you that okay your your subscription is about to expire or something it's actually not cool. like a physical person that i send that message to you send that notification to you send that email to you that's why like when i can automate a system that is actually like that actually that actually built with its back end that i send that um they can last information to you that okay you have not yeah let's see yeah yeah let's see a low on balance now to make it transfer from let's see no let's see you're low on balance on your card and let's make something that okay your card is your card is declining can you change it so that automated system let's see in terms of subscription like there's a time the time of the month that okay so let this actually like the dogs amount from the bank account so that basically See on that back end because basically automated there's no there's nobody to come and say okay you have not paid though there's not, someone not sending message to you because imagine now netflix actually has a million they say a lot of users let's say over a million do you think they'll be sending messages to a million users no they won't do that you have to like make it automated so that it can actually serve users better because if they're doing they tend to send messages to one million users all at once Let's say you do, don't be, they won't even be able to send your messages even in, even in a month, even within a year. I don't think that you will be able to send that whole message. You just, you just manual process. So, back in that time, you a lot of things to make it. And also, you also use something that has to do with all these payments. Like, let's say, going to, you go to a website now, you actually make a payment. And every time you put your card details, it's still on that back end. Like, don't press it down, boom. So that back end development sending of meals let's say you use gmail now for example you don't send a note to someone you still on you see a place of back end person that sees it file upload so like google drive you upload files to google drive and save somewhere it's still on that back end and you can also use the, uh, the aspect of um ssc ssc code yes ssc code where it actually functions to back end so you can see back back end is in every aspect that we look at it. Then yeah, every aspect that interact with technology, there is backend in it. So there are a lot of backend uh, languages and frameworks such as PHP. PHP is basically used for like for web applications or backend applications. So it can be used for payments, it can be used for um like it can be used for LMS systems and a lot more. And we have the framework such as um Laravel, we have Pimen, Symfony, Kubernetes, KKP, and so much more. We have a lot of these frameworks. Also, we have Python too. Python is also it can what can be basically used for anything. That's why I said back end it comes across all areas. But Python can be used for game developments. Python can be used for my development. Python can be used for um let's say um data science, basically for data visualization. If better can be for everything. So I said back and plant involves no area of like um tech. So you have Django, which is used for web development. We also have Flux too. And also we also talk we have also know, you know JavaScript. JavaScript actually that, that can actually be used for this function. But for JavaScript actually run on the back end, we use what we call the runtime environment. So it's not like an environment for it to actually run JavaScript on top of it. So yeah, and that, that what we call Node. Node is the runtime environment for JavaScript. And not the framework just like Express, Nest, um, Calcoa, Pascal, and so much more. We also have Golang. Golang is actually like well, one of the popular um, backend languages that we have. And actually not like a complex. I won't say it's a complex. It, nothing, that is, unless it, nothing is complex, basically. But Golang is actually one of the backend technologies that we use for all the technologies for backend. I also have Java. Java also is actually like a good backend technology too that we use for. And also there are the job opportunities for backend developers. The backend developers basically can work as a um, data administrator and basically that they want to charge of like managing databases and all of that. They can also work as a security engineer just like the um just like the lead that was the lead on Security, cloud, cyber security talked about like for it to be cyber security it seems to be a backend developer so there's no how you can do cyber security without name backend so 
basically back end reference to involves that. But you can also work as a back end engineer, basically build complex systems, build a lot of applications. You can also build back end also involves is also into is also in um, game development too. Uh, you can also build games, name back end technologies and example of, of languages for development is um, C sharp and C sharp is really a good language for development C sharp or things C plus plus so the C sharp C plus plus for game development. Also is Unity. Unity is not a back end and uh, technology just like for basically the whole um, interface behind those or um, let's say you're playing color this now the whole interface behind that is uh, under Unity. But backend development is just the basically the core of how the gameplay is. I just it. And there's basically a wide variety of things that do with backend development. That's just name a few. So um, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, do reach out to me and I'll be to answer you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, for this session. It's really, really nice. This is the front end development track um, where we have digits. Any woman, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I can ask this anymore. So, again, um, how on the character space, everything about front end development. So, David, can we have you, please? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Please, can you, can you all hear me? And by any chance, can you hear me? Please just signify in the chats. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Anikomen, and I'm the technical co-lead for the front end track. Okay, so very quickly, I'm just going to talk on what front end de development is, why front end development is important, what you learn in the front end track, and um, a couple projects we'll work on if you do join the front end track benefits of joining front end track and then you know how to join the front end track okay so first of all what is front end development right so really simply very very simply front end development is the process of creating user interface and the user experience of a website or web app basically what all that jargon means is that front end development is all about creating the look and feel of a website or web application the reason you're able to interact with YouTube, the reason you're able to interact with Google Meet, the reason you're able to interact with, typically, literally, let's say anything on the internet is because of, um, is the job of a front-end um, developer, right? Okay, so as a front-end developer, there are many, many programming languages we use. One of them is HTML, which we use for structure. We have CSS, we use for styling, for making the website, look good and they have javascript for interactivity basically what that means is that let's say you're you're on a shopping website right you want to buy something when you click on a button to buy the front end takes care of that should i say interaction that makes you able to buy whatever you're shopping for okay so now we move to why front end development is important so front end development is important because it is the first thing users see when they visit a website or web application. It's very, very, very crucial. I might be biased since I'm you know, a front-end web developer. But basically, without the front-end, quite literally the whole like, stack that come in harmony to work on websites, it's pretty much easy. Because without the front-end, you can't make use of the, should I say, servers and stuff the back-end engineer gives you. The designs, the designer creates cannot be implemented. So basically, the front end is very, very, very crucial because it's the first thing users interact with. Also, a well-defined or let's say a well-designed front end can not only help to attract, but can also help to retain users, while a poorly designed front end can lead to users abandoning, let's say, the website or 
all the application. I'm sure I've experienced this before. I'm very sure I've experienced, let's say you log on to your website, right? And let's say the website is very ugly or it's very slow. It's up. You like, you know, leave the website because find it very, find it very, should I say, inhibiting in a way. But you get the point. So moving on, what will I learn in the front end track? So breaking it down very simply because in front of track, we try to be inclusive to both beginners and should I say seasoned experts. So um, very simply, working with the basics of front end, that's HTML, CSS, JavaScript. And with these three um, technologies, you can quite literally build anything on the web, which is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We'll also be working on, or also you also learn about React and other frameworks, kind of like we have frameworks like React, we have frameworks like Next, we have frameworks, in fact, we have a lot of frameworks, basically. Don't worry if this sounds like, should I say, jargon, but eventually you get to you know, know what they mean and know how to use them. So what kind of projects will I work on the front-end track? In front-end track at GDSC, you'll be able to work on a variety of projects, such as simple websites like, let's say, a one-page website. I don't know how many of you have seen ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a very simple website. It's very simple something for you to build. You'll be able to learn that. You'll be able to work on that in the front end track at GDSC. Also, you'll be able to build single page applications, build web applications with real time data. Like, let's say a weather app. You'll be able to build an application that takes in data and displays the data that, oh, you can check on your website and say that, okay, in Lagos, so the, um, the degree in Lagos is 20 degrees, the degree in Abuja is 31. You know, all of that and all of that. So what are the benefits of joining the front end track? For one, you'll be able to learn from the very experienced front end developers like myself, technical colleague, and a lot of members in the front end track. You'll be able to work on challenging and rewarding projects. You'll be able to build a portfolio of your work. Basically, if you want to become a front end developer, joining the front end track will be able to give you projects you can add to your portfolio. You also be able to network with other front end developers because I feel like if you have been in the tech space for a while, you'll have probably heard this a million times that networking is key, networking is this, networking is that. And also you'll be able to get access to resources and supports to help you on your journey. Basically courses, um, blogs, articles that can help you get better and all of that. So how do I join the front end track at GDSC? Well, for, um, for starters, you need to be a member of GDSC before you can actually join the front end track. Then you need to have a basic understanding of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, though it's not compulsory since we'll still end up teaching to you guys. And finally, you need to be willing to learn and grow because it's kind of pointless if someone forces and forces something into you and you don't want to do it. There's no way you can learn that way. Okay, so finally, in conclusion, Front-end track at GDSC is a great opportunity to learn about front-end development. It's a great opportunity to build a portfolio of your work. And if you are interested in becoming a front-end developer, I highly encourage you guys to join this track. Okay, thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll be open to answering them. Okay, thank you so much, Dizzy. It was really nice. It was an amazing session. Um, it is we're able to learn so much about um, front-end development, and I believe a lot of people who are interested in doing front-end track. So thank you so much. Um, you if you have nice. any questions for David, okay. So if you have any questions for David on the front-end track, um, be able to just um, comment it on our chat section. Just write the questions. Any question, there is no stupid question, there is no um, beginner question. We are open to different questions on the chat section. So as soon as we see them, we are can to as soon as possible. Yeah, so yeah. feel free to message us. Feel free to message um, and chat with us at the um, chat section even after the event. So um, right now, we just, um, I'll just try to brief you on certain things that we've been doing since the beginning. It started with different tracks, we have discussed different tracks. Okay, yeah, we have, um, right now, we, I, I can see my boss, 
Michael Mutu, he's our um, technical lead for um, the cloud computing. So he'll be talking to us about cloud computing. I know so many people are anticipating what cloud computing is and what it really entails. So um, Michael Mutu will take us through what cloud computing is, what we can, um, the career opportunities basically, and just for you to know what to anticipate in the cloud computing track coming on soon. So, uh, Michael Mudu, over to you, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm please. I'm not your boss. I'm still learning to. Um, please apologize. I only have to apologize for coming late to this session. I was held up somewhere. I humbly apologize. So, um, my name is Modu Michael, and I am the technical lead for cloud slash DevOps track for GDSC Funab. And um, I am humble and willing to serve and make everyone see the light of cloud. We just like cloud evangelism, don't mind me. So um, the slides are going to be coming up now. I don't know if they're already up, but um, I'll just do a quick run through of what the cloud slash DevOps track entails. So um, please, can, can everyone hear me? Because it looks like everywhere is just quiet. Yes, we can. You can hear you. Can. All right. Thank you. So, um, many times, um, I'm sure in one way or another, I would have heard of cloud. I do cloud. My things are on the cloud. I use iCloud. So, what exactly is this cloud? So, um, over the years, tech has been evolving. Year and year, year in year out, tech has been evolving. Now, understanding what cloud is is not actually far fetched because we use cloud almost every day in one way or another we use cloud for something many of us that use an iphone make use of the icloud and the icloud is where we back up our information right it's like store them so in case your iphone gets missing you can easily retrieve them now people that make use of gmail gmail is a very good example of a cloud now you might not know this but all your messages are being saved somewhere because when you pick up a new phone, you can just open your email. And when you open your email, all your emails are still there. That's to tell you that, oh, these messages are being stored somewhere. If you check your Google account, I don't know. I think, I don't know if it's like 50 gig that Gmail gives for messages or something. I can't recall. But there is a certain amount of storage Gmail gives to you. Your Google Drive is an example of a cloud storage. So moving further, I'll just define what cloud computing is. So cloud computing is the on-demand delivery of IT resources over the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. Now, instead of buying, owning, and maintaining physical data centers and servers, you can access technology services such as computing power, storage, and databases on an on-demand basis from a cloud provider like AWS. Now, what I just read can just simply be explained as this. Now, previously, when you want to deploy your website, right? Now, let's say a company, um, let's just say a company or an organization wants to deploy their resources to the internet. Now, now the previous process would entail the development of that the development of that web app or of that resource that they want to deploy and they will pass it on to the deployment team and to deploy that resource they would need to get a server right they would need to go and purchase fiscal servers now servers are very expensive anyone that's checked the cost of servers will know they are very expensive and depending on how powerful they are they can span in millions of naira. so when they get those servers right they will have to configure them which might take some days and after configuring them, they also have to make sure that there's uninterrupted power supply for that server to operate and other things. The temperature has to be cool, there has to be cooling so the servers don't go hot and explode and all that. But with cloud computing, anyone can just 
have access to these fiscal servers without actually owning them in the sense that okay all i just need to do is open an aws account and when i open an aws account in minutes in fact it's possible to deploy a web app now on aws in a minute by creating a server and deploying it immediately using bash scripting that's to show you how things have been simplified that is what cloud computing is all about is the simplified approach for product delivery that's over the cloud you don't need to buy these things you don't need to manage them physically and all that you just need to assess them so that's it now cloud computing sometimes is always being interchanged with devops right but these two things are these two things are different things entirely now devops is coined from developer and operations right with development and operations so Dev devops is a combination of cultural philosophies practices and tools that increases an organization's ability to deliver applications and services at a high velocity evolving and improving products at a faster pace than organizations using traditional software development and infrastructure management processes now the perfect explanation of that will that whole story or that whole paragraph i just read out is this the main focus of devops is to reduce the time for product delivery to market that's essentially what devops is in the sense that the way that software products are being developed traditionally previously has to be improved right so devops just aims to speed up the delivery process of products and a very important part of devops is automation whenever you hear automation your mind should be going to devops because devops aims to automate processes that are repetitive for example you want to one thing about devops is devops is a subset of cloud computing because devops engineers mainly make use of cloud resources or cloud computing that's why you can see the reason why they are looking synonym syn they are looking synonymous right they make use of cloud computing now for example if you want to get a server right for example as a company you want to get there's something we call there's something we call parallel operations and there's something we call nodes operations like there are some applications that require very high processing power or computing power that means they require a number of servers right the, you cannot just use one server for it. A very good example of those high-end kind of applications are, let's say, the Flutter with API, Paystack, and all those kind of things. These are things that you don't want to fail at any particular point in time. So they are going to require more resources, more computing resources, more storage, excellent flexibility, and all that kind of things. So what DevOps aims to do is this. In a situation whereby, okay, let's say, to deploy this particular web app, we need... I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. I'm just trying to meet up with time. I apologize. So in a situation whereby we need, let's say, 50 servers. Now, it makes no sense for an engineer to go and start configuring these servers one by one. Like, it's repetitive and it makes no sense. So what does DevOps do? It does, a DevOps engineer is saddled with the responsibility of automating this configuration in the sense that with a tool like Ansible or Terraform, they can be able to spin up these 50 servers and configure all of them in the space of minutes. That's what DevOps aims to do. So um, I know this has been long, but I hope I've been able to do justice to what cloud computing and DevOps aims to achieve. So I'll be moving on quickly to the rest. So why cloud? I've explained why we use cloud. Now, we use cloud for storage, for mobile applications. We use them for servers, databases, and we have different kind, kinds of cloud. We have the private cloud, hybrid cloud, and the public cloud. Now, the public cloud is the one that is accessible to everyone. The private cloud is the kind of cloud that organizations use in the sense that not everyone has access to that, their cloud base or to their cloud infrastructure. It's only people within the organizations that can access it. Then we have hybrid cloud, of course. Hybrid means a combination of two more things. Now, a hybrid cloud is a synergistic integration of the private cloud and the public cloud. So, moving on, 
how to get started in cloud engineering. Now, cloud engineering, actually, there's a common misconception I would like to clear before proceeding. Many people will just say that, e, front-end engineering, no more. I will write code. I have to learn JavaScript. Actually, me, while I was learning cloud, I actually started learning cloud in old school Africa. I don't know if anyone knows of old school Africa. So <laughs> I'm sorry if this is like a story. So I started learning cloud in old school Africa. So a major reason why many people went for cloud engineering then was because they were like, oh, well, for cloud engineering, I will not need to code anything. I just need to just dive into it. I just need to learn Linux one or two. I just need to learn some fuse and just proceed. But it's not actually like that. If you want to be very good as a cloud engineer, you would need to know how to code at a certain point in time. That's why it's advisable that you learn Python on your way to getting started in cloud engineering. Anyway, in the next slide, we have the roadmaps and resources available for cloud or DevOps. Now, getting started in cloud engineering is very easy. It's not, I want, it's very easy because there's, there are ample resources to help you get started. Like, it does not lack resources, honestly. And a very good resource that anyone should know when getting started in cloud engineering is the first one, learn to cloud.guide. Now, it was created by Nana and a, couple, and a couple of other engineers or cloud developers. Now, it's a roadmap, a very well explanatory roadmap that will tell you everything you need to know and what you need to learn. That's like the best resource you can ever get. Now, the other ones are the DevOps with Nana. That's a YouTube channel. She's the one that is also a contributor to Learn to Cloud. Then you have AWS, GCP, and Azure documentation. Of course, you need to learn their documentation or read it to be able to understand what services they offer and all. Then, of course, you have Linux tutorials and free code camp networking courses. You need to know Linux, bash scripting, and networking to be able to excel as a cloud slash DevOps engineer. Now, quick insight into what the cloud slash DevOps track is cooking. Now, um, I don't know. I think this is the first time we should be having a cloud or DevOps lead. I don't know what, if this is not the first time, then I don't know. I'm just excited that we actually have this track. I'm very much excited. Now, into this session or when we resume next session or even before we resume next session, we are going to be having live learning sessions where topics are going to be Topics are going to be released. We are going to be doing a lot of live sessions and learning sessions where we can we can make available resources to be able to learn some things. Like speakers will be coming up to teach Linux and to explain certain things, Linux bash scripting, a little bit of Python, you know, Docker, Kubernetes, containers and all. We'll be having live learning sessions. Now writing challenges. A very important part of DevOps is, or cloud is learning how to document. <laughs> I'll tell you why. The funny thing is, unlike front-end developers and back-end developers that you, they can easily show you their code or show you what they were able to build. For example, a front-end engineer builds a portfolio website. Can you say, guy, come and see? <laughs> a back-end engineer can also show you what he's doing. But the funny thing about cloud slash DevOps is, According to somebody, the person said, you go explain tire because <laughs> you are going to be running a lot of commands or you are going to be doing more of writing commands and doing all these kind of things, deploying, deploying, deploying. And most of the time, let me just say this way. It's not like you don't have evidence. So you have evidence, but people will be like, ah, nobody you write this code now. So it will be your problem, all that kind of thing. So the only way you can be able to like show what you've done is through effective documentation. You write down what you built, how you built it, what you aim to achieve and what you achieved. So that's why I encourage anyone going into cloud slash DevOps to learn how to write very well. Then we have weekly slash monthly projects. Of course, you can easily do that by sending out projects weekly or monthly for us to be able to learn. You have mentorship and certification guides. So closing thoughts. I want to leave you with this and I want to round up now. Um, it is important not to follow trends, but simply do things that interest you. Now, 
I started off as I started off learning Python for data science in data science Nigeria. And after training the Titanic data set, I ran away because I felt like oh well, this one fee this one is not really for me like that. Then I went to go and learn easy front end or ML, I can't remember. Then I went to Android. I I, I know I let learned that but for Flutter, but it was because my laptop was misbehaving when I was trying to install Android Studio. I dumped that one. So finally, finally, I just chose cloud engineering. I was like, okay, what's this one safe? And when I started doing it, I actually liked it. And I was like, okay, this is for me. So that's why I'm actually doing it. So what I just want to say is it's important not to follow trends because many people are saying that more the thing that is hot kick now is DevOps. That's why you want to do DevOps. It's not important. Just if it interests you, please go for it. And all. so the next thing is, it doesn't matter what, and the part of not following trends, if you were in yesterday's session, you have seen where the panelists were trying to argue about trends and all. <laughs> it was very interesting, by the way. Now, the next one is, it doesn't matter what your motivations are, strive to be the best at what you do. All right, so um, if you choose to go for DevOps or anything, if you choose to go for DevOps, or cloud at any point in time. Now, don't be turned down by the by the assumption that eh, you are just going to it because it's a trend and something, 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 something like that. If you can do it and you can do it well, or if you can learn it, it doesn't hurt to add it to your skill set, honestly. Because now I've seen many front-end developers and back-end developers that are actually trying to adopt cloud into what they do. Is it plus for you on your CV? You can easily just learn what cloud is about and add it to your CV. So with these few points of mind, I hope I've been able to convince you <laughs> that the GDSC FUNAB cloud slash technic cloud slash DevOps track is actually a very interesting and promising one. And we hope to have you. We hope to work with you and all. So goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike Yomoto. And yes, you have been able to convince us because this is really nice. You have been able to convince me that yes, cloud computing is really a very good track and DevOps, right? So um thank you very much for the enlightening talk and the advice. And yes, we follow passion, yes. We do also follow our passion and choose the right track that we can follow still. So thank you for uh, thank you very much for this um, session. So this will be the end of our track exposition. It has really been a very nice time. I've been um, talking to different um, technicalities, unraveling what each track was all about. We started with, I think we spoke about seven tracks, which is a lot. Yes, a lot. So the point of all of this is for you to just um, go through what each of them has said and choose the one that interests you the most and pick it up and Yes, then you start the track, start the track with them. It's really going to be an amazing journey when we start our mentorship session where each track will be teaching us and taking us through with how everything they have discussed today, how it really works and how you can really high school. Yes, we become that tech pros and tech suits that we really want to be. So um, let's anticipate our mentorship session. And today, like I said at the beginning, is the last day of our three days after exam series. And we hope you were able to enjoy every of the sessions, starting from the um, debugging session to the panelist sessions, and today to the um, track exposition session. It has personally for me, it has really been very nice, and I've really learned a lot. I've really learned a lot. One of my um, takeaways from um, from the panelists was be following our passion. We're not going with the flow, and eventually, if we pick a start today, and um, we see that okay, today um, we are no longer feeling it. It is fine if you go to another process because most of them, had, do, most of them didn't start there. They did not start with what they are doing right now. So there was process to everything. But wherever you find yourself and whatever interests you the most, just pick it up and continue. So, um. I would love to invite um, our lead, our um, our Gapata Kata, the boss, our GDS lead, in person of Peculia, Abolade, to like give us a um, standing up talk about the whole series. 
Hey, Kulia. Can we have you, please? Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for this wonderful session, the team lead, and then the co team lead as well. Thank you so much for handling this thing as a. You handled it with so much care and you did it like your own. So thank you so much. And this is a public appreciation to everybody who has tuned in since the very first day. Today is the third day, first, second, third. I understand that everybody is busy, but even with that, you guys have made um, time to attend this session, to learn online and relay. So thank you so, so much. For you, my appreciation goes to my team members. Yes, you guys did a lot in putting this together. You did a lot in making it a success. Should we talk about publicity, the sacrifices, the late night calls, and everything? You guys are just amazing. So this is a shout out to everyone of you. Thank you so much. And then I'm clapping for you. I am God reward every one of us. And then we'll talk in high places. Thank you so, so much. So with this, we are bringing the after exam series to a close. Can I shout? Thank you for staying true from the very beginning to the end and even this end is the beginning of another end so we are still making plans to keep um, the group as interactive as possible the mentorship sessions and the other exciting events that every one of you should anticipate GDSC is not stopping anytime soon and we are here to carry everybody along so even if you don't know about tech GDSC welcomes you even if you're an intermediate or maybe an expert whatsoever, whatever stage it is that you are currently in your career, GDS is here to hold your hands. And for me, I'll go back to the videos to learn words because you can agree with me that there are sometimes you'll be on a call and then it's not as if you're not listening, but you just keep some things unknowingly. But then when you go back to rewatch them, you get like full information about what the host or maybe the speaker is talking about. So I'd implore everyone of us to not just let the series die down. Go back to it, listen to it all over again. Your favorites have spoken, Precious Scholar, Wally, MHG School, Abib, Shokbeju, Badebo. I can't even mention every one of them. And these guys are full with so much wisdom. So I would implore everyone of us to go back to it and then sit back to see what GDS has in store for everybody. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for um, your words, your contribution in one way or the other. It's so good to have every one of you around. So with this, I bring up the exam series to a close and then that's all. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.